Okay, I think we've uh, got our attendees. So welcome everybody to Statues Must Fall, the latest in a series of Quilliam webinars. Uh, this is gonna be a slightly different uh, format from the ones that we've done before. It's gonna be more of a friendly chat than a series of presentations from the panelists. Uh, but we do have a star guest and our star guest is Umar Lee. And Umar Lee is one of the most engaging it's fair to say, political activists in the United States. He has a fascinating biography. We could devote a whole series of chats to his backstory, which starts with his very much in the past um, connection to Anwar al-Awlaki, his critiques of both Salafi and Sufi forms of Islam, and onwards to his social activism from Ferguson onwards. But none of this is the focus of today's conversation, because for the next hour, we're going to be talking about statue toppling we're gonna look at the whole question of the removal of public monuments to individuals whose lives contained disgraceful episodes. So before we start, I'd like to urge you to participate in this uh, webinar. We, we don't have the audience on camera, but we do have a Q&A uh, uh, feature. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a Q&A button. You can stick your comments in there. Uh, I will do my very best to read out as many of them as I can, and we'll use them as jumping off points for the further part of the discussion. Um, but back to Umali. I mean, the reason that Umali is a great person to discuss these issues is because he's been at the forefront of a campaign to remove one particular monument in his home city of, and I have to be very careful here, <laughs> British people always pronounce it wrong, St. Louis. Okay, we are talking about the statue of St. Louis, otherwise known as Louis the Fifteenth, Louis the, the Ninth. Ninth. King of France. Sorry, that's I was so concentrated on uh, this will be edited out in the video. Um, we're talking about the statue of St. Louis, otherwise known as Louis the Ninth, the King of France. And in a moment, I'm going to ask Umar to tell us about that campaign, but. And from then, we're going to go on to discuss the fundamental principles that structure debates around the removal of public symbolism. But let's start with the statue in question. Now, about a month ago, when statues started to be removed by demonstrators, my social media was full of Jews, primarily Jews, pointing out that an awful lot of respected public figures of the past were vocal anti-Semites, and a number of had, had actually harmed Jews in pr pretty significant ways. Why were their monuments not being targeted? Now, few of the people who were making that point actually wanted the statues to be torn down. They were essentially making a rhetorical point about double standards. But I have to say, there was considerable supply of surprise, and I have to say in some quarters delight, when it was reported that there was indeed a campaign to remove the statue of St. Louis. There was even greater surprise when they discovered that it was Umar Lee who was heading the campaign, and that he was also campaigning to rename the city. So, Umar, why should St. Louis go? What was so bad about him? Well, it's a very simple question. There's, there's many reasons the city of St. Louis should not be named St. Louis, and that a statue of Louis IX shouldn't overlook our city on top of Art Hill, standing 50 feet high above the hill. Right, it's an impressive, start, it's an impressive statue, isn't it? It's, it's a an really impressive, impressive statue. And the people that built it over 100 years ago, they were wise and they could see the future. They gave it a 25-foot base. <laughs> and I'll just leave it at that. So, but uh, but uh, um, it, it's quite simple. I was a part of the campaign to remove the Confederate monument from Forest Park, which is just a half mile away from the Louis IX monument. We just removed the Christopher Columbus monument in St. Louis in Tower Grove Park. And it's time to turn our eyes on Louis the IX. And why Louis the IX? It goes back to one of the oldest hatreds and oldest bigotries, you know, that, that, that we know, and that is anti-Semitism. And I wrote an article a few years ago in the Riverfront Times, a local publication talking about this. But several years before me, a Jewish scholar named Amy Levitt wrote an article in the same publication, really outlining the historic case on why St. Louis should honor, should not honor Louis the Ninth. After her article, uh, my good friend, Rabbi Hershey Novak, the Chabad Rabbi of Washington University, held a Tisha B'Av uh, 
uh, gathering there, which described as the, the day of uh, mourning the loss of the temple. And if you, if you, if you were to attend uh, services for that day, one of the first things is the lament over the destruction of the Talmud ordered by uh, Louis the Ninth. Uh, his uh, ordering of Jews to wear unique clothing, which was an idea as a story Michael Allen has pointed out that six and a half centuries later was, was used by Nazi Germany. Uh, his confiscation of the wealth of Jews to, to finance his crusades. Uh, his right, I mean, that's a bit an, an interesting one, isn't it? Because, you know, yeah, yeah. money was confiscated by Jews to fund an, an attack on, on Muslim states. On Muslim states, yeah. Right. And, and so, uh, uh, so his anti-Semitism is thoroughly documented. And St. Louis is a city with a, um, you, know, a, you know, a rather significant Jewish population. Also, if you look at the crusading posture of Louis the Ninth, and you know the Crusades are a bit more complicated because when you talk about the Jewish population, you're talking about a, a defenseless population that is really under the, the care of the monarch. But the crusading of, of Louis the Ninth, uh, he was a bad crusader, wasn't wasn't very good at his job. Uh, two Crusades, dies in the second one. Uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem are the last words. I like to say. I've been to Jerusalem several times, uh, stayed almost a, a year there at one point, and Louis the Ninth never made it. So no. uh, I got one up on Louis the Ninth. <laughs> so, 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 um, uh, and you also look, when you talk about violent religious extremism, which is something that we're all trying to combat in the modern era, whether it be ISIS or Al-Qaeda or any of these Salafi jihadi groups or, uh, any form of violent religious extremism, whereas, you know, you know, uh, Christian fundamentalism, et cetera. Uh, Louis IX very much represented that with his, um, uh, his vehement persecution of those who were outside of uh, Catholic or orthodoxy on the continent of Europe, including uh, helping to fund the Northern Crusades in, in the Baltics. So what we also have to take into account is with Louis IX, we're here in the United States of America. We fought a revolution to rid ourselves of a monarch of King George III. Now we had a divorce, we got back together, we've had some great times together in the US and the UK. But the, uh, uh, you know, you gave us the Beatles, you gave us Elton John, and uh, we helped you out in the Second World War. So I think, I think it was, you know, yeah. A pretty good trade-off. So, the the in America, should we be naming a city after a a, a king, uh, when in fact uh, this is not what this country was, was was built upon and based upon? And it's definitely we don't aspire to the values of anti-Semitism uh, and, and, and anti-Muslim aggression. So, okay, uh, I, I'll pick you up on that, that last point before we move on to the, the body of the discussion, because I saw a tweet from you on the 4th of July in which you, you certainly yeah. floated as a possibility that America might become part of the United Kingdom again. Is that so going to be your next? A, that, was, that was a joke. But so I, that's not your next but, campaign. That's not my next campaign. but Because we'd love I, to I, have I you. <laughs> right. Hey, I, I posed the... A historic question: Was it a good idea to separate? <laughs> you know, was it a was it a good idea? I mean, UK, you got universal health care, you got a great passport, you can go all over Europe. You know, US is like an island; we can't go nowhere. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm in St. Louis. I mean, you, it, for the time it takes me to get to Canada or Mexico, you could be all the way across the European continent. So that's uh, true. As long as know, we keep I, our, I, I just. As long as we keep our yeah. travel rights in the European Union. Um, well, you know, you, you got to work. You got to work that out. You know, I did yeah. see Nigel Farage a few years ago, and uh, I tried to. He w he did. He wasn't very friendly, but I did try to question him a little bit. But uh, I hope that works out for you. And he's a guy who who often talks at people rather than to them. So yeah. okay, yeah. to get onto the meat meat of the issue, I'd like to start mm -hmm. by making two obvious arguments. You've okay. all heard them many times before, but they're good yeah. jumping up off points for the general question of whether it's the right thing to do to topple statues. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, there are very few powerful historical figures who ought to be celebrated for the good or important things that they did, who didn't also conduct themselves badly in some way. 
Um, the second sort of supplementary point is that societal consensus as to what is bad had has, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it was universally the view in the, the 13th century that, that killing and expelling Jews was a good idea, but it was a fairly sort of pro widespread and popular idea. And Louis IX was not the only uh, uh, yeah. king who, who did that. Um, so that being so, statue toppling is a pretty blunt rhetorical instrument. How does it help us to celebrate the good while condemning the bad when it comes to judging the actions of past historical figures? Before I, before I answer that, I just want to back up real quick. Yes, of course, killing Jews and persecuting Jews is a great European tradition that, they, that many people practice, not just Louis IX, but yeah. all throughout the European continent. Um, I mean, that's the big reason there is a state of Israel today is because of the historic persecution of Jews in Europe. That's, that's how, you know, uh, Zionism uh, um, was, was created and was conceptualized. But we have to realize that's not just a 13th century mentality. That's, a, that's an idea that resurfaces in every generation or two. And it's an idea that is resurfacing, resurfacing in this generation, resurfacing on the right with both monarchism from tradi the traditional Catholic movement, railing against modernism and, you know, monarchy. And, and, it, 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 and it, at the heart of that ideal is anti-Semitism, is that Vatican II was some kind of a Jewish plot to, to weaken the Catholic Church. You can transfer it to neo-Ottomanism. Mm -hmm. uh, these, uh, this traditional Sufism that has become popular with Erdogan and is using the state resources to spread the you know, this Turkish nationalism slash Ottoman uh, nostalgia. At the heart of that, there is an anti-Semitism. We can look at it in the uh, in anti-Semitism on the left posing as anti-Zionism, right? So this is something that is very current to our daily d discussions now. It's not something that that's removed in the abstract. And if you go in history, there are no perfect figures because there are no perfect humans. We are all flawed. I'm flawed. Everyone else is flawed. Right. So I jumping mean, in at that point, because right. I know you were going to get to your key point, but at that yeah. point, is yeah. the answer not to say, well, you know, let us have no statues at all. You know, the, the, the Protestant and the Muslim position that it's a bad idea to have statues might actually solve this issue. I mean, if everybody is bad, surely we have statues of nobody. You can have great works of public art right. uh, that celebrate ideas, that, that, that celebrate moments, or that even possibly would take the human form, but, you know, such as uh, some of the monuments have been create, created for the veterans of the Second World War, right? It's not a, a particular soldier. It is something created to, um, to, to remember those that were in that service. Uh, but to, to make any statue of, of a man, or one figure, you would always be open to this, you know, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, these, these discussions. So I generally think, and this isn't from a theological perspective, this is from a practical perspective, I don't really think it's a great idea. Mohammed, let me bring you on. Great. Um, so this is great that we have uh, two Americans dominated in the conversation. Right. <laughs> um, USA. But, hey, USA, right? But, you know, I think this is interesting because, you know, Umar, I'm curious, how do we address this issue when we go, like, I'm a product of the American South, you're Midwest. Mm -hmm. And how do we reconcile this as a child of, of, of the complexities of the Confederacy and the Union and, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with your thoughts on how do you address that? Is that a, is it a monument? Because I mean, to be frank with you, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm adding more into this question, but I think you understand where I'm going at, is the flip side is you could easily have African-American communities and particularly this past week, and we saw in Stone Mountain, Georgia, who were assembling, trying to challenge uh, what they saw were white supremacists who were gonna convene. How do you find that right balance? Because it could easily switch the pendulum where you create, dare I should say, black supremacists as well and a form of radicalization. So I, I, I'm curious what you would say to that. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question that you pose. Definitely what happened to Stone Mountain, you know, was a 
visually something very stunning to see in the in the cradle of the Confederacy, in the cradle of the Klan, um, you know, where the grandest of the Confederate monuments is carved into the mountain, you had this march of dozens of armed African Americans. I think really, if you look at uh, uh, a spectrum of activism, I mean, we're here in St. Louis, so you, you go back to August 9, 2014, Mike Brown is killed. And really, St. Louis has been in the streets on and off since August of 2014. And really, historically, we really kicked off this modern Black Lives Movement mm -hmm. here in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. There's a spectrum on, among activists, right? So you will find people out in the, uh, in the streets or people that are well-known activists that are just pretty standard Democrats, just pretty standard liberal, liberal Democrats. You'll find people that are very far politically on the left. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say very far, I'm talking about Maoist, communist, you know, mm -hmm. these types of organizations. Uh, you will find people that are what they refer to as hoteps, you know, or the, the, mm -hmm. the uh, um, uh, you know, the pro-black, the, the um, uh, uh, Farrakhan-ish, mm -hmm. you know, uh, type of thing going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a spectrum. And you know, within, that, w w within this movement, there is a debate. But one of the things there's been a consensus on is the removal of Confederate monuments. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that has not been controversial. Uh, and I think there's been sound and rational arguments made for that that have been embraced by white Americans as well. Uh, because without the support of white Americans, these monuments would not be going in most of those places. Now in exactly. St. Louis, we have a degree of influence where I could just announce, hey, I'm coming to take down the Confederate monument and the city gets scared and they yank it out. But some of these places are not places like St. Louis. They don't have this energy on the streets. It's been a very uh, orderly uh, discussion to remove because the, the argument is, is quite clear. The South lost the Civil War. Uh, if you look at the articles of, 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 um, of possession from the Confederate States, all of the articles are explicit in that the reason for the secession, the reason for the war was slavery, is that their economy was based on slavery. And that the monuments were built, most of them 50, 60 years after the Civil War as a part of the cult of the lost cause to rehabilitate the cause of the Confederacy to bolster the current Jim Crow segregation of that era. You know, I spent a lot of time down in Texas, and there's a Confederate monument by my place down there, and that was literally paid for by the local chapter of the Ku Klux Klan, and it said that mm. on the monument. Mm. They just agreed a few weeks ago that they're going to take out that monument. So I think, you know, there may be issues where there's disagreements, you know, on strategy. Uh, you know, you may have some people saying, I'm not going to take uh, a... Um, a COVID-19 vaccine, you know, that might be a, uh, uh, unfortunately, that might be something that's out there, but it's out there, you know what I know, or uh, uh, other things of that nature, but the monuments is not something that has been controversial uh, and, and has found a great deal of support um, amongst white Americans and others. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, nothing's going to get done unless the minority and the majority come together. And I think right. you're right, it's that common, that common uh, principle, that common idea. Um, how will this play out, again, and I'll give it back to David, how do you think this will play out in light of at the local level? I mean, you have a, I, I've been following from a distance here, mayor and the confrontation that took place there with the two homeowners, the president retweeted it. I mean, how is that gonna play out with potential elections in November? Um, what's, what's the mood right now in, in that well, area? I'm sure the impact. St. Have. Louis is hot right now. Yeah. St. Louis is hot because you had the protest movement post George Floyd. You had the McCloskeys mm -hmm. out with their guns on their mansion. Mm -hmm. uh, their mansion actually backs up to a synagogue. And last, mm -hmm. over the weekend, I did security for the synagogue because they've gotten threats. Uh, mm -hmm. from neo-Nazis as, 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 a, as a tie to that. You have um, 
Unfortunately, last week, a Palestinian business owner slapped an African-American woman. Uh, people came back to the business and shot and killed a Palestinian teenager that works at that store. Um, the day after, a group of black activists announced a boycott of all Arab stores in St. Louis, which the Palestinians own a lot of businesses in the black neighborhoods. There's just so many things going on right now. Which is a they separate mayor, issue that we have to bring you on about too as well. Right. Go ahead. They're all separate. I'm just saying all these things are coming. And the mayor, yeah. people are asking for her resignation mm. because she doxed 18, I believe it was 18 citizens. So people are protesting outside the mayor's house. Okay. Her election's coming up next March. August, we got a hot election for prosecutor. This St. Louis is hot and heavy right now. And the, and the monument issue is playing into it all. It's just, it's just all coming together. The same people that are protesting outside of Mayor Lada Cruz's house were there at our monument statue, mm. I mean, at our monument protest. So it's all kind of coming together. Does, does it matter whether you win or lose this battle? I mean, is the purpose of this actually to take down a monument or is it to have a discussion about the historical figures and the way in which we regard them? And the, you know, I'd have thought that a significant number of people, probably the vast majority of people who heard about uh, the, the statue campaign, that was the first time they knew anything at all about uh, uh, what Louis the Ninth uh, did. So, I mean, is, the, is the, the, the main value of doing this that you have these discussions? Uh, does it really matter whether you get rid of the statue at the end of it? Well, I'm an old wrestler, and I wrestled for the great Charlie Sherrod Sr. was my coach. And Coach Charlie Sherrod said second place was a loser's prize. <laughs> so whenever I would take second or third place in a tournament and I would get a silver or bronze medal, I would politely walk off the podium and drop that silver or bronze into the trash can. Uh, so I, I, I like winning. I'm competitive. And this is about winning. Now, obviously, in the course of this, whether King Louis comes down or not, we're going to have a discussion. We're already having it. It's starting about anti-Semitism, about the history of the Crusades, et cetera. And we are having further events. This weekend, there's an interfaith prayer rally. I'm not organizing, but I'm doing it. I'm going to be there as security. Interfaith, Muslims, Jews, Christians will be there praying. The same, you know, white nationalist types have announced it. Some of them that they're going to attack this interfaith prayer. So it's this weekend is going to be hot and heavy again on Sunday night. Later on in the month, we got a Jewish event at the monument. Uh, led by a local Orthodox rabbi and a Reformed rabbi, they're coming together. So I like to think I can bring people together. Yeah, yeah, so that's we, we, that's you know, the most difficult bridge uh, to, yeah, to, yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, sort of span, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. So, so uh, uh, this process of education is ongoing. We had a comic book store here in St. Louis. Just a regular comic book store. Uh, you know, owner Martin Casas, not a Muslim, not a Jewish guy. He, uh, he had as his logo for his business, King Louis the Ninth on his horse. Mm. And he said, I'm taking it down. He said, I'm going to change my logo because of, you know, I don't want to offend any Jewish or Muslim uh, uh, customers. Okay, Omar, that's, that's I, I, I had a quick question. Sorry to jump in, David, just one yeah, second. How, how are you working with, or how, I've been following, you know, the press on it with the Catholic community as it relates yeah. to this. Right. Yeah, that was my yeah. question as well. I'm sorry. So, yeah, you, so you, you go and answer, and I have a follow-up to that. Uh, the Catholic press is, uh, well, I mean, you know, the, the, there's many Catholics that are upset now because they view Louis the Knight as a saint of the Catholic Church. They're praying at a statue. They've been gathering nightly. Uh, but what they need to address, and all religious communities need to do this, is the rally that they had last Saturday, there were for a few priests there. But who was the majority of the crowd? It was the Proud Boys. It was the white nationalists led by Jim Huff. Uh, it was this Christeros movement, which I had never even heard of before that. So it was, it was a gathering of right-wing radicals that is well-documented. And you had a few devout Catholics mixed in. Now, if a Muslim goes to a rally... Uh, to defend, I don't know, not, I, I'm, I don't know if there's a monument, just say a mosque or whatever, right? And uh, 10 
devout Muslims show up and 20 Taliban show up and 20 ISIS show up, mm. you know, those 10 non-Taliban and non-ISIS are going to be asked, hey, and they're going to have to respond. Mm. So far, they have not responded. They've created this um, myth that there was a gathering of rosary praying Catholics and, and all they wanted to do was pray and this was an attack and persecution of Catholics, when that's not uh, the reality. On our side, we had several uh, practicing Catholics. So we had, a, I mean, it was on Shabbat. So there were very few Jews there. Uh, matter of fact, I had a rabbi uh, tell me, said, I could have got 50 people if it wasn't on Shabbat. And I said, but we have to have it on Saturday because that's when we wanted to preempt them. Uh, there were maybe four Muslims there, five, four or five Muslims, you know, you know, it was, we had 150, 200 people and almost everybody there was, was, you know, you know, were four or five Jewish people, four or five Muslims and everybody else was, you know, Christians or I don't know the religion, you know, just St. Louis activists. So, uh, I mean, uh, I take that point and I think it, 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 it's, it's a strong one. I mean, it, you always have to be careful about who it is who joins your cause and if your cause visibly becomes dominated by very nasty people then inevitably you question should I really be supporting this cause but I guess that potentially uh, something else is going on which is that devout uh, Catholics by and large don't come out and demonstrate it's street fighters it's street politicians yeah. you know yeah. and so these are the guys who are coming out and what I'm going to suggest uh, as a sort of counter argument uh, to this is that um, Catholic, you, you, if, there were, if there is a way of having a discussion about the badness of uh, King Louis um, that didn't involve um, effective, effectively a attacking a, a saint, the discussion would be an easy one to have. I mean, to give mm -hmm. you an example, you know, I, I, this is a bad parallel, but let's say I, uh, uh, somebody looks through the, the Quran and finds something in there that they find objectionable. Uh, they, uh, they would like to have a discussion about the objectionable nature of the text, um, but they start off by burning the Quran. Now doing that is such a symbolically sort of aggressive uh, act that you know that once you've done that, that will shut down discussion. Whereas yeah. there will be huge numbers of people, you know, uh, Muslims uh, of, of all stripes who would be prepared to have a discussion yeah. about those texts. Yeah. So Louis the Ninth, uh, if he wasn't a saint, this would be a lot easier. Okay. If he wasn't yeah. a saint. But because he was a saint, and I'm not someone from a Catholic background, you know, there's not a history of Catholicism in my family. And I got to be honest, I really was unprepared for the level of devotion that people have for saints. Now, St. Louis is a heavily Catholic city. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in an area that was heavily Catholic. Right, it's about a quarter uh, Catholic. Fergus, Lewis area. It's, it's, it's about a quarter Catholic, but some areas are much higher. And I grew up in the Ferguson and Forest area, which you see amongst white residents, uh, the majority, probably 70, 80 percent were Catholic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and even if you're not Catholic, if you're middle to upper class white, 90 percent are sending their children to Catholic schools. So the Catholic Church, through hospitals, through schools, has a big reach, even outside of adherence to that faith. Old money in St. Louis is Catholic money just because of how the city was founded, the roots of the city, the old French, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I wasn't really prepared for the level of devotion people have for this thing. So it does create an interesting philosophical question. Uh, just for example, if you look at this, a better parallel, in my opinion, would be a Sunni Shia one, right? So someone from a uh, Shia a background would say, um, you know, I, uh, I don't like Omar, or I don't like Khalid and Walid, you know, because of incidents that happened in history. The Sunni, whether he has knowledge of this, whether he has information of this, is, is going to, need, in a knee-jerk manner, defend Khalid and Walid, is going to defend Omar, just because I'm a Sunni, this is what a Sunni is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that many of these Catholics, when I sit and talk to them, they don't know anything about Louis the Ninth. 
you know, you know, they certainly never heard of persecution of Jews. Uh, although I will say some of them had defended the persecution of Jews, uh, but some of them have never heard of it, right? They just know he's a saint. They're defending this person who's a saint. And now I understand that. However, and this is the compromise uh, me and my friend Ben Verimpa have brought up, and uh, and uh, Ben is an Israeli immigrant to St. Louis, one of the hottest restaurant tours. Yeah, Israel. no, I've read about him. Is 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 we are going to propose the Archdiocese of St. Louis to take the monument, right? If mm. this is a, a saint to you, if he's dear to you, put him on church property. But Forest Park is public property, not private property. Mm. Forest Park is maintained by taxpayer dollars. It's not a religious place. So you're, you know, the laws in the UK are a little different, but in the United States, we tend not to have religious places and monuments on public grounds that Jewish taxpayers, Muslim taxpayers, non-believing taxpayers have to pay for. If he's dear to you, you want to pray at the monument, there's a beautiful St. Louis Cathedral Basilica about two miles from the monument mm -hmm. And I toured it the other day, and I went in the back. They had plenty of room in the back to just put it right there. You'd object to it. Come on, you'd object to it being stuck in the cathedral, though. No, I don't care if it's... Yeah. The cathedral could have anything. I don't care what goes... I mean, that's... The, look, when you talk about religion, yeah, there's problematic people in all yeah. religious history, right? So, I mean, what you do on your private... And all religions are a little weird at the end of the day. We all know got that. their yeah. quirks and weirdness. So, if... Yeah. So if you want to put your monument on your private property and pray, that's your thing. But I don't want to take, you know, my family to the uh, St. Louis Art Museum, which is a beautiful museum. I went there the other day and walk out. And the first thing I see is Louis the Ninth on a sword with a horse. As yeah. Robert Hershey Novak said, he's not holding a book. He's well, holding a sword. Well, I mean, that's interesting because we've, it, we're stuck, the, yeah, the statue of Edward Colston, who was a, you, you, you I'm sure will have read about it, but he was a, yeah. a, a, a slaver, but also a, 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 a philanthropist in Britain. Right. About two, almost 200 years after his death, because there was a fear he'd been forgotten by one guy, um, a, a statue was created to him. That statue was later thrown into the, uh, into the river. Right. Um, it's been taken out, and the plan is then to stick it in a museum. And you know what the plan? Did they get it out of the water? They 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 they, they, they the hoiked it out. They hoiked it out, and they right. found all sorts okay. of very interesting things in the statue when they right. they looked at it. But the plan is to to pull it out and put it into a museum. And in a museum, you know, there will be a plaque next to it, which will say, "This was at Edward Colston." Here was his statue. This is when it was put up, and why. Uh, this is uh, what happened to it, um, uh, and and the, the the arguments that that motivated people to remove it. Here is what he did for the city of Bristol. Here is at least partly the source of uh, his wealth. Now, it, it isn't you know, it, it isn't that a, a, a good outcome that that statues. Uh, that are problematic are relocated but are put somewhere which makes it possible to have that sort of thought-provoking um, information providing uh, dialogue. I think it depends on the situation and depends on the statute and depends on the funding. You know, is it going to be private funding or, 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 or public? You know, for example, the Confederate monument in St. Louis was technically the daughters of the Confederacy had uh, paid for that. If they want to take that, that's fine. Uh, but I don't think there's any museum that needs a thousand Confederate, you know, monuments. But if you want to take a few of them and contextualize it in the historic museum, uh, that's another thing. But you have to separate those that are religious in nature from those that are not religious uh, in nature because the Confederates are political in nature. That, that was a political cause. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I go back to the, um, and I'm, this will be my last point before I hand back to Mohammed, but um, the, in the United Kingdom actually does have a very close um, parallel to uh, uh, Louis IX. Uh, we had a, 
a very, very, and stop me if all this is familiar to you, it'll be familiar, I think, to many of the people who are on this, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, uh, webinar, but we had a, uh, a very powerful 13th century baron who was a crusader, who was an exact contemporary uh, of King Louis. Uh, he may well have known him, in fact, um, uh, uh, called Simon de Montfort. Now, Simon de Montfort uh, uh, distinguished himself in a, a rather negative way by massacring and expelling Jews. His son, uh, who fought alongside him in the Crusades and died on the same day as him, uh, also uh, had a horrific uh, uh, record of massacring uh, Jews and expelling Jews from cities. Um, he was uh, a very similar figure to, to King Louis, but he also was, in many people's uh, eyes, the guy who started parliamentary democracy because he called two parliaments. They, the second one was the first parliament that any country really had ever had, which uh, didn't just consist of the noblemen, but consisted of ordinary people as well. And he was the first guy uh, uh, to hold the king, King Henry III, who ultimately killed him and chopped him up um, to account. He, he sought to constrain the power of the king. Now, without constraining the power of the king, without some form of uh, parliament-like body, we wouldn't have parliament, we wouldn't have Congress, we wouldn't have the Senate, you know, all, all of these things that, that ultimately lead to even presidents like, uh, you know, Donald Trump, being constrained by courts and yeah. um, uh, and, and parliamentary-like bodies. Yeah. All of these things start life with Simon de Montfort. And this goes back to the question that I, I started with, which is de Montfort was a genocider of Jews. He was also the father of uh, parliamentary democracy. There is a university in uh, Leicester, which is where Simon de Montfort came from, which uh, uh, is called Simon de Montfort University. It's, it's difficult to say it shouldn't be. All, you, all you're saying is you're telling me this guy is responsible for George Galloway. That without right. him, you would... <laughs> I think, that, I think Gall Galloway prefers Stalin style autocracy, I think. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, 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 notwithstanding. But I think that, look, there's this argument that when you take down monuments, you take down statues, you're erasing history, right? That history is gone. And I don't think that's a correct argument. The history is still there. You can, if Louis IX can come down to St. Louis, you can still go to St. Louis University and Washington University. He'll still be in your coursework if you're doing medieval studies. Whatever effect that this person had, positive or negative, will still be within the culture, within the society. You know, it's not erasing the negative. If this person wants, you want to contextualize this person, say, well, this person was bad in this way, but he was responsible for some good trends, you know, parliamentary democracy, um, et cetera. Uh, those are things I'm pretty sure that will still be covered in UK coursework, uh, you know, if you go to you know, no, that's not the, but the, I'm in, not making the point that, that I'm not making the point that he should uh, that, that that unless we have a statue we'll never remember him you know unless we have a place main name or a university these people will disappear of course you know they won't um, but I'm, I'm making a, a slightly bolder argument which is you sh sh loads of people were killing Jews in the 13th century it was a, a universal that was what people were doing throughout Europe right. in the 13th century there was right. nothing exceptional about Simon de Montfort. I don't think this is true, but the argument is there's nothing exceptional about that. Yeah, but the there was something exceptional that deserved to be honoured about being the first guy who said there's got to be some sort of uh, restriction on uh, on the king's power, and that ought to be a parliament which can is composed of not just noblemen. Now, surely, you know, that deserves some form of honour. Get a little plaque in parliament. <laughs> give him his role. No mind. You can give him a little plaque. Give him a little plaque. But you have to. I mean, I don't think it's a very good message to send. Uh, in his case, I can't even pronounce his name or Louis the Ninth to to, uh, to uh, 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 you know for Jewish residents of that particular city. And you're right. History is full of anti-Semites. It, it was the norm, and it still is the norm in many places. But that doesn't mean. 
uh, that just because it was the norm at that time that you give that person the best. You reckon, you know, all people are complex. I mean, we can go through 20th century Stalin. Okay, Stalin was one of the most evil people that ever lived. But the fact of the matter is he had a major hand in, in defeating Adolf Hitler. But that doesn't mean, you know, we, we, we go to Tbilisi and to the monument of, uh, of uh, Stalin and, and pat it a couple of times and touch our heart. You know, you know, you have to run. Okay, we're complex. Every human being is, is capable of good and bad. But when, but when the bad uh, uh, in our modern context outweighs the good, then we have to uh, recognize that and realize that this will be offensive to some citizens. Okay, I've got a couple of other questions. Um, okay. I've got one question that I'd like to pose uh, from the audience, which is, what's the procedure in your hometown for removing statues? And why is it so hard to remove uh, this statue? I mean, it's well, in public land, right? <laughs> you know, there must be some sort of process by which this can be done, a referendum. Okay. What, how does it the, work? The big, we have a couple of problems. Not one problem is a logistic problem. It's got a 25 foot base. So it's very difficult to remove. The Confederate monument, we just simply told the city of St. Louis, the city said, we don't have the money. You know, we kind of like to take it out. We don't have the money to do it. And so I got on TV with a local business owner. I said, hey, no problem. You don't have the money, don't worry about it. We'll just go down there and take it. We'll, we'll take it out for you. And then in the middle of the night, the city took it out, kind of forced their hand, they did it. Louis the Ninth, they know that we don't have the capability to have this big construction equipment to remove it just because how it's sitting on the hill and it's sitting high. Um, so the process would be to go to the Board of Aldermen. So in the city of St. Louis, you have a mayor and a Board of Aldermen and, and the, the board is, is, is stronger than the mayor. So we have a weak mayoral system. And we have one member of the Board of Aldermen, uh, John Muhammad, who's a, a, the, old, the first Muslim uh, member of the Board of Aldermen. He has agreed uh, to sponsor it, uh, to help it get to a vote. It's our job to go and lobby uh, other members of the board uh, to vote on this. The mayor could also unilaterally take this step that is right. within the mayor's power. But unfortunately, uh, I don't have very good relations due to 888 votes short last election <laughs> with this current mayor. But we do, but we do have a mayoral election coming up in March of next year, and so we're just rolling. You know, we got. Look, St. Louis, we have big elections in August. We got the presidential election in November, and then we're going into March. And if we get a new mayor, Tashara Jones, who's the St. Louis city treasurer, um, I think you could very likely see a, a mayoral decision to remove uh, the monument. But Omar, not to, surely not to change the name of the, the, the city. That's a tougher sell. That's, that's a, tough a hard one. one. <laughs> Mohammed, Omar, let me pass on to you. No, no, just real quick, Omar, are you, uh, ha have you considered running for office? I'm just He's curious. done it. He's done it. He's run for office before. No, well, well, I should say, excuse me, this time around, are you thinking about running? My efforts, August, I, I'm fully supporting uh, Kim Gardner for circuit attorney, Sergeant okay. uh, Jones, the treasurer, uh, uh, Alfred Montgomery for sheriff. Then we go into November, Joseph Robinette Biden, the most exciting American political figure since Bobby Kennedy, <laughs> Joseph Biden. And, and, and then we go into March and we'll try to elect to show Jones the mayor of the city of St. Louis. So that's, that's where I'm focused. I, I had a question, I'm a, if you allow me, David, just slightly, on, it's on topic, slightly off topic. Um, so we're seeing these moments in light of your background mm -hmm. where Jewish and Muslim and uh, others are coming together, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really exciting to see what's taking place, particularly I'm thinking about this in the US and the UK. Um, and I'm also thinking about your extensive background, certainly on the the amazing work you did on the Salafi Dawa, uh, where I first was introduced to you, your work. And again, thank you for that analysis. What do you, where do you think this is going to go in terms of more kind of collaborations on a shared vision with these various groups and particularly Jewish and Muslim communities and, and speaking up for our Jewish brothers too as well? What do, you, what do you think? 
I think it has to, uh, the status quo is not acceptable. You know, I've seen the Muslim community really change in relation to the Jewish community. So if you go back to the 90s, pre 9-11, you know, you have AD and uh, BC. And I think of American Islam as pre 9-11 and post 9-11. Well, pre 9-11, it was very un-extraordinary to have an imam at Juma uh, sing the praises of Hamas and of suicide bombings and, 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 and you go into a Muslim book section and it'd be the protocols of the elder design Mm-hmm. And the Muslim community was full of just everything was Jewish. Yasser Arafat secretly Jew. Uh, mm-hmm. The king of Saudi Arabia is not Jewish, but he suckled from a Jewish woman as a baby, and he was cursed mm-hmm. by the Jews. I mean, this was the the dialogue all throughout the Muslim community in the, in in the pre nine eleven era. I remember being at Dal Hijra, not too far from where you live, and there was the horrific bombing of the. Was it the wedding party? Uh, no, it was the pizzeria where they killed all those, those children, teenagers. Mm. And they announced it on the microphone, and there's maybe 500 people there, and you get text, beautiful, oh, look, look. No, so there was mm-hmm. this tremendous uh, uh, um, uh, anti Israeli sentiment that became anti Jewish sentiment. It's really, you really can't separate the two. Mm. I mean, some people try to, but you really can't separate the two. And so the status quo is not acceptable. Now, in the post-9-11 era, what we've seen in America is that Islamist politics, unlike the UK, Islamist politics have become passe in the Muslim community in America. They're very French. The Islamists are very fringe mm-hmm. in America. Now, and the left has become very strong. There's mm-hmm. been this hard left turn in the American Muslim community. Mm-hmm. And so they're, they're no longer sitting talking about Hamas and suicide bombings and, and uh, you know, uh, Jerusalem is a walk to the Muslims and da 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 da. But they've transferred the anti Jewishness to, well, we're anti Zionist. We're not anti Jewish. Well, when, when excess of 90% of, of, of Jews are Zionist, it's, it's effectively anti Semitism. Mm-hmm. So that's what we have here today. So when I wrote an article a few years ago saying that Muslims should oppose BDS, the boycott, divest in a uh, sanctions movement, uh, which singles out Israel when you have all kinds of, you have China, you have, uh, uh, you know, Burma, you have so many human rights violators in the world. I got almost uniformly negative feedback from Muslims. It was hard to find any Muslims that were supportive of it, unless these were people that were, you know, you know, had some kind of uh, 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 other thing that they were trying to do. So we have a long way to go. Uh, but I do think there are some voices in the Muslim community now uh, who realize that the status quo is not working and you have to have a, uh, uh, a better relationship with our Jewish neighbors uh, and brothers and sisters. Great, thank you. I mean, very similar things have been happening since, again, since 9-11. I'm, it's not to say they didn't happen before, but 9-11 gave a real push to Jewish uh, Muslim friendship type uh, activities. Um, and there have been a number of uh, them in, in the last few years that have been yeah. very high profile and tiny things as well. So, you know, yeah. there was an article in the press today about a Jewish woman and a Muslim woman in Birmingham and they were cleaning off uh, racist and anti-Semitic uh, graffiti uh, together. And uh, things that have been organized from the top down and things that have been organized from the bottom up at the same time are, are very sort of yeah. heartening yes. uh, 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 things to happen. Generally speaking, it is... Uh, uh, Islamist uh, aligned groups which hate those things the most and do what they can to get yeah. them cancelled and sadly sometimes not, they're successful. But not even just them, it's some of the far left groups as well, mm-hmm. some of the, uh, you know, the, uh, um, you know, and there's this kind of, we have this kind of merger now of people that, you know, the rhetoric is far left and Islamist mixed. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of it's kind of this brew where they mix yeah, it together, and, and that was absolutely the case until about five or six years ago in the UK, and I'm I would imagine it's similar in the US, but, uh, because what essentially happened was that um, the far left groups backed Assad, yes, and, uh, yeah. and that created yeah. a huge, huge gulf. Not, I don't think I, it's a different dynamic for you guys. It's yeah. a different dynamic, so that has caused a rift. Syria has caused a big rift because mm. a big portion of the far left has backed Assad and, 
you know, the Iran Russia line. Yeah. Uh, but there's been a rift. There's some on the far left that have uh, that have become upset by that. Also, generally speaking, Americans, no matter their backgrounds, are not as sophisticated and well read up about the rest of the world. So, so in many, I've seen this. You have uh, uh, Muslim activists that hate Assad. They will be marching with pro-Assad organizations just because they don't have the literacy that maybe people in the UK have because we don't have as great a proximity. Exactly. Uh, I guess that's true. I guess that's true. Exactly. We're in the last few minutes of, of this webinar, and I wanted to just sort of bring it back to the, the, the initial topic. Um, yeah. I, I think we've, we've done the issue to, to death. We, I think we've canvassed all parts of it. But the, the one thing that I wanted to, to, to talk about briefly was the danger of... Um, uh, I, I'm trying to think of the right, right way to express it. It, effectively, this, the, the spread of the process of toppling uh, uh, statues mm. from really, really good core cases to slightly less good cases to cases which uh, really sort of uh, uh, have resonance only in tiny little parts of the community. So, for example, there have been a number of um, attacks in the UK on people who who's uh, the, the, sorry the statues of people who you know it's difficult to say exactly what it is that they did that was so objectionable other than living 100 years ago so lord baden powell the founder of the scouts who was a very strange and old man uh, I, I don't think anybody really understood why it was that he was considered to be a likely target for uh, for protesters but then we moved on from that to uh, uh, threatened attacks on Gandhi, and Gandhi is a, mm. uh, he's not quite a Simon de Montfort figure, but Gandhi certainly said some horrifically racist thing about things yeah. about black people, yeah. you know. which he may have changed his mind on, but you know, he's, he nevertheless said them and, and acted on the basis of them at some point in his life while doing good things as well. And then finally, uh, in the last sort of 48 hours, um, a, a statue of Haile Selassie has been smashed. Uh, mm. And the reason for that uh, it will, will be obscure to, I would have thought, 99.999% of the population. There is a, a, a controversy in Ethiopia over the death of a popular singer, mm. and it's become highly political. And so there are sections of the uh, Ethiopian diaspora community who have expressed their their anger uh, by smashing the, the statue of Haile mm. Selassie. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is a, 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 an argument, but it's the argument of the danger of precedent. You know, we agree, great idea in this one case, but what about this next one and this next one and this next one? And then suddenly you're you're smashing statues and white, whitewashing over murals and churches like the ancient Puritans did. I, I just want to say that in my home state of Missouri, about maybe an hour and a half from where I am right now, Winston Churchill delivered his Iron Curtain speech at Westminster College. Uh, I attended a graduation there last year. And uh, there's a museum and a bust, a monument of Winston Churchill. So I'll, I'll report to you if Churchill is under threat uh, in, in Fulton, Missouri. But what you're saying is, is I, I understand what you're saying. You know, in, in Texas, you had uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, a singer. His monument was, uh, you know, vandalized. They didn't break it down, but they vandalized it. And, uh, you know, obviously this is a man who died, you know, in, uh, I don't know, the later part of the 20th century who was nothing to do with the Confederacy or anything of that nature. So within... Uh, activist movements, there are people of higher levels of literacy and people of lower. And then once you get a, a, a excitement, once you get uh, people hyped up in the street, you can have people that just see any statue, you know, they, and, and, and tear it down. They may not know who the statue is of, they missed out on tearing down the last statue, or they had fun tearing down the last statue. And they're going to and they're going to tear down another one. They may not know why it was torn down. So I do believe there has been some of this going around. And also, you do have, uh, you know, some friends political philosophies that may have a unique gripe with some specific person that uh, most people uh, may not 
know about. And I come back to the central point is that I don't think it's really a good idea uh, to have these monuments to uh, historic figures in public places. If you want to have them in the museum, that's fine. But uh, I don't really think it's a good idea. You know, uh, I mean, even the uh, Churchill, that's at, uh, at the university in the, in the, in the library area. Don't Very forget to, I was going to just say, don't forget to as well, what a few weeks ago, Sean King comes out and says, remove the white Jesus at the churches, which, you know, <laughs> as you all uh, have been following, just as I have, that created an uproar and it incited the president in the United States and everyone else. And it just creates, yeah. so I think to David's point, you know, how far are we willing to stop? Is there legitimate critique? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think we Well, you know, we don't have, we don't have time for Jesus in this, uh, in this panel, uh, but uh, that, that sounded bad, you know. <laughs> of course we have time for Jesus. We but, do, no, we do. But, Look, I, I, regard, uh, I regard any depiction of Jesus as anything other than my particular shade of beige as cultural appropriation. Don't forget the Persian uh, depiction, or the, the most of world historical depictions of the Prophet Muhammad, which yeah. we won't get into that. It, so well, exactly. no, Exactly. Sheer, sheer tradition is different yeah. on this, as we yeah, know. Right. But, but, you know, there's a long discussion. I mean, I'm not a fan of Sean King after what he did in Ferguson and many other things, sure. but uh, there is a long discussion on the white Jesus, you know, Nation of Islam, you know, they talked about it. It got into the le language of hip hop, Ice yep. Cube. We go to church and they tease us with a picture of a blue eyed Jesus, you know, so all, you know, that, that's kind of a, not something that Sean King invented. It, it, it's something that maybe he said and, and mainstream white America latched on to, but yep. that's been a very real discussion in the black community for, for generations yep. uh, of, um, of what G. Gordon Liddy, the Watergate conspirator, referred to as the sweet Jesus, uh, the blonde haired, blue eyed Jesus. So that's a, uh, that's a whole nother topic. That's a whole uh, but we know, but we know the, es but the essence of, of Jesus's universality. And so, you know, yeah, that, yeah, uh, yeah. That, that, yeah. it's a he's a category unto himself. Yeah, exactly. uh, you notice I use unto in a very biblical well, way. Well, I'm gonna tell you, my, my grandmother, who was a devout Christian and, 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 and brought me up in the church, you know, you know, I I'm come from a religiously mixed family, and my, my, my dad's family were Southern Baptist, yeah. and um, you know, she had a picture of Jesus, but she bought it from the flea market, and it was actually Charles Manson. In her, <laughs> okay. Well, on that bombshell, we are at the top of the hour. I think that's a, a perfect place for all of us to to start. It's been an absolute delight uh, discussing yeah, this. Is wonderful. I, I'm looking forward to you coming to London, Umar, and we will go and watch a, a cricket match together. Hey, because, I can't you know, wait. We, we, we've got a game that's even slower paced and even more boring than baseball, and you're going ah, you're gonna, to you're gonna see it live. Oh, <laughs> All right. Okay, everybody. Nice and time. thank you very much thank to you. everybody who uh, participated, sent their comments during this uh, webinar. Uh, there will be a follow up email to this. Um, and one of the things it'll ask you to do is to join the Quilliam Circle. Uh, Quilliam ex exists on essentially donations from people like you. It, it, it is your, literally, the fees that people pay, the, the donations that they give, that enable us to do fascinating uh, webinars like this. Uh, if you'd like to uh, continue, if you're not already a member, please do join the Quilliam uh, Circle and please do donate and uh, please keep listening to our webinars and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you.